Hey guys, welcome to the channel. Welcome back to another video. I'm live as usual, about one time a week. I try to go live, guys. My name is Eric, and uh, I am also known as Smart Money Bro on most, probably all um, social media outlets. And hopefully, you guys can hear me. Um, you know, I've owned, let's just jump into it, let's just start talking. I've owned and manage rental properties for the last 22 years. And so on this video, guys, I wanna talk real estate. I wanna talk rental properties. I wanna talk about what types of things you should be thinking about before you become a landlord, before you become a rental, uh, buy rentals and become a property owner that's gonna rent your property out. First off, I wanna thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing to this channel. Thank you for sharing the video, commenting on the video, uh, sharing links to my videos. Um, our channel, Smart Money Bro on YouTube, is growing. And uh, it's only a little over a year old, but it's growing a lot. And so I just want to thank you guys for that first and foremost up front uh, before we get started and do anything else. Just letting you guys know that uh, I appreciate you guys. Um, the other thing is if you have comments, feel free to drop them. If you're watching this on YouTube, drop your comments. If you're watching this on another uh, platform, feel free to drop a comment. I'll be more than happy to answer questions along the way. But this live stream is all about buying rental property. You know, what you should know and be thinking about before you get into that process. Because it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a lucrative way, a lucrative thing to do. The buy and hold of rental property is very, very lucrative. It's very nice. It's very good. Helps out your retirement, gives you a monthly cash flow. You get appreciation on properties. There's so many positive and pros to it. But I want to talk to you guys about things that the gurus don't always talk about because it's not all roses when you own rental property, right? So I want to give you the real deal about owning rental property. You know, the things that you should know before you become a landlord, before you jump in this game, right? That's what I would do. Critical information is what I want to drop to you guys. Things that you got to know that when you flip on YouTube and you watch whatever guru it is, I'm not going to name any names of gurus, but when you watch them, you know, they're flashing this and they're driving this and they're standing next to this. And it's like, okay, but it takes some work, doesn't it? You know, they make it seem so simple when it's not already that always that simple. So I've got 17 things I'm going to go through on my list. If you have a question, ask. And I, these are things that I want to share with you guys and say, hey, sometimes the game is free. You don't have to always go to the $2,000 seminar or do the, the $15,000 challenge that they, they advertise. Sometimes the game is free on YouTube. On this platform I'm on, also on IG, the game is free today, okay? Let me just fix some stuff. All right, the game is free today, guys. So, and I'm looking through comments and so forth, so bear with me if I'm not looking directly in cameras, okay, guys? Um, again, drop comments. Let's talk about it. Um, let's, let's just jump right into it. Okay, what do you need to know before you become a landlord? What do you what information do you have to have and should you have before 17 things? Let's jump into it. The very first thing you need to know is that you can have someone manage a property. OK, you can also manage the property yourself. You have options. Let's put it like that. When you first buy rental property, you don't have to be the landlord that handles the day to day to day to day. Right. Might not be your thing. You may be too busy and you may know people that do this, right? They hire a property manager up front and they do this because they just don't have time, but they want to reap the benefits from the investment of rental property. And that's cool. So me personally, because I've managed my own properties for the last 22 years, I always recommend that people manage the properties themselves for the first year or the first two years. Now, there's reasons why I say that. Now, if you're busy, I get it. You can't do it or it's an out-of-town property that you're not near. I get it. But if you can, I always recommend you do it for yourself because you're going to learn so much just by managing your own property. You're going to learn a ton of stuff. What to do, how to do, 
what things cost, how to procure. When I say procure, I mean buy, how to buy certain things, how to purchase this, how to purchase that. Um, it's going to make, it's also going to make life easier when you want to actually go get a property manager, because you're going to know what the property manager should be doing and how they should be doing their job. If you've spent a year or two or three years doing it yourself. Now, if you just buy 30 properties off the bat, you don't have time, right? But if you buy one or two, I recommend you go ahead and doing the property management on the property up front first, right? You cannot substitute the experience that you're going to get by actually doing your own property management first, okay? You're going to you're going to learn again. You're going to learn a lot. So please keep that in mind. If you get a property manager up front, you buy a property and you immediately bring on a property manager. You're not going to really know or be able to monitor or manage that property manager the way you could if you knew what you were looking for and knew what the property manager should be doing. So there's nothing worse than hiring a property manager. Uh, and I've heard this many a time that you have to monitor yourself. So go ahead and get do it yourself if you can. If you're not overwhelmed, that's my suggestion suggestion for when you first buy a piece of rental, rental property. Now, number two, you'll learn um, quickly as a landlord or property owner that being a landlord is not as simple as it seems, okay? It's not easy. It's not for everyone. Everyone won't be good at being a property manager or being a landlord. It's just that simple. There's certain things, and I'm going to talk about some of those things that are difficult for some people. Um, you know, and I need to, I feel like I need to caution you guys about this because, again, you're going to see uh, things on YouTube and things on Instagram and people on Twitter that are going to make it seem like it's simple. And it's not as simple as people try to make it out to be. Again, it's not for everyone. Um, I'm not telling you it's the hardest thing you're ever going to do in your life and you can't accomplish it. There's, you can't, I'm not going to say that because you can do it. Because I believe that if you can learn how to you know, be a welder or if you can learn how to be a chef or if you can learn how to you go out and get a college degree, become an accountant, whatever. If you can do those things, you can certainly learn to be a good landlord. OK, it's not impossible. Um, but there's certain things that you have to do um, that you got to be thinking about. So let's talk about some of the, those things. First thing is this, or not first thing, number three. I'm on number three, actually. Number three is that you need patience to be a landlord, to be a good landlord. Um, you know, things are going to try you and things are going to get on your nerve um, <laughs> that you're going to have to have some patience with. And I'm going to talk about tenants because tenants is obviously a big piece of this. But, you know, it takes time to accumulate properties because one property is cool and you'll make a little bit of money. If you have a mortgage on a property, you'll make a little bit. Depends. You might make four or five hundred, eight hundred dollars a month, two hundred dollars a month. Um, but, you know, you might want to buy more than one property if you plan to make more than that. Um, typically properties, you know, you know, the more you the more you have, the more you make, obviously. But the thing is about that. The thing about that is this. You have to have patience when you're in the game of rental properties, the long, the, the whole, the buy and hold game of becoming a landlord. You can't be an impatient uh, um, landlord who flies off the handle and think you won't be in the game very long if you don't exercise some patience. Just put it like that. Number four is you got to be organized as a, as a landlord. Got to have your ducks in a row. If you can't, if you're not an organized person, you might want to get somebody to help you be organized. I've seen many couples that get into, you know, buying uh, rental property and holding on to rental property. And maybe, you know, he's good with the paperwork, but she's good with people or vice versa. But, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to being a landlord who manages their own property. And you may not be good at every single aspect of the whole process. So keep that in mind. You want to be as organized as possible. Um but if you have to partner up because, you you know, there's a partner out there that's looking to invest or you have a spouse or somebody that wants to invest with you and you can't do it all yourself. You're not good at these certain things, but maybe the partner or somebody else is good. OK, so um, just keep that in mind, guys. Organization is really important. Now, number five is this. Number five. Number five is simply this. 
you got to have processes in place, okay? Processes that you control that are in place. Remember, and we'll talk about this later, it's a business, so you got to have processes. You got to have a tenant screening process in place. You got to have collecting. How, how do you plan to collect rents? That has to be a process that's in place. Um, going about repairs and maintenance is a process. Your lease um, how are you going to bring new people into the property? How are you going to manage the property throughout the terms of the lease? What's going to be on your lease and in your lease? Um, what type of information? All that stuff is something that things that you control. And those are your processes, right? So you got to figure out what processes you want to put in place. And I always suggest to write them out. Even if you write them out one time, this is what happens to a lot of landlords. A lot of landlords... What happens with a lot of landlords is they don't have processes. They're not very organized. And what ends up happening is how they manage their pro their properties become a reflection of them. In other words, when you see a, a house that's shabby and ripped up and torn up and you know the, the landlord is a slumlord. Well, guess what? That landlord is probably not organized. The landlord probably don't have a set of processes that are written down that they follow and go through. Right. So take this thing serious. Right. Speaking of a process, let's go to number six. Number six is this. This is a business. Number six is this is a business. You are a business. If you have one property or you have 100 properties, treat it like a business, right? If you are not, if you're not good at business, it's possible that you're not going to be good at being a landlord who runs their, 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 their properties like a business, Right? And you don't want to get into that slumlord thing, right? Where you become somebody that doesn't take care of the properties, doesn't do maintenance on the properties, only wants to collect a, collect rent, doesn't, right? That's not where you want to be. You, you want to be a person that does this thing right. And if you want to become a landlord or a property owner that rents out their property and do it right, think of it as a business, right? Too many landlords out there running their, you know, running this as a, they're not running it as a business. They're running it more like a little part-time deal. And guys, listen, if you run it like a part-time deal, it's going to look like a part-time deal, right? Don't be a shabby slumlord. Treat it like a business, right? And speaking of that, get you a CPA. There's a lot of things that you can write off a business, right? We know that a lot of write-offs and things. There's some things you can't really write off. You have to uh, write it off over the course of 27 and a half years or what have you. But get a good CPA. Now, that takes me to number seven. Number seven is have a team, right? Have a team that you uh, rely on. Um, you don't have to do every repair yourself, right? You don't have to uh, lay the carpet. You don't have to change out the HVAC. You don't have to learn how to... You don't have to do that. But if you have a good team around you, meaning you have handy people, you have a plumber, you have an HVAC person, company, whatever you want to call it, but have a team set up. And you don't have to necessarily just have that team just for, um, you know, you can have that team start getting that team in place before you buy your first rental, right? Perhaps you have your own property and with your own property, you have, um, you have, uh, people that do work for you at your own property where you live and you've been, they've been doing it for two or three years. You trust them, make them a part of your team when you go out and buy rental property. Okay. So you don't have to do everything. I heard, you know, somebody told me, well, yeah, I like to do everything myself, Well, you're going to be spending a lot of time doing everything yourself. Um, over the course of 20 plus years, I've been able to, you know, get a, you know, good plumbers, you know, good HVAC people, AC and, and heating and cooling people. Um, good carpet guy who lays carpet uh, for me. Um, so, you know, you, you're going to accumulate that over the time, over time. But as you start off, be thinking about a good team of folks that can help you um, put this thing to work and make it work for you. Right. Um, it's a it's it's a lot of relationship building and things like that. If you're not cut out for that, then perhaps being a being a landlord is not for you. Number eight. Number eight is this. Think about where you want to buy a property. The location of your rental property is crucial. It's vital. Where you buy a property means so much. I know you hear about location, location, location. Well, that's true. That's true. And that's true. The school district. Is the area growing? Is the area not growing? What's happening in the area? What's coming to the area that you're looking to buy your rental property and what's leaving the area? 
right? What What's trending in the area, right? Oh, they're building new homes over here. Oh, they're building uh, apartment complexes. Oh, there's, you know, Wendy's just built over there and Taco Bell just built over, whatever it may be. You need to know that stuff. Know what's coming. Know what's going. Be aware of that because that's going to affect your rental amounts. It could it could affect your appreciation of the property over the course of, of time. So, you want to know all about that. It's going to also affect what type the location is going to affect what type of tenants you can attract to your property, right? So all those things are important. I always tell people, shy away from buying rental properties in places where you don't feel comfortable being at night, flat out, because there may be an, a, a time when you may have to go over there in the evening or, you know, later on when it's almost dark or so. Who knows the point? Or you may have to go over there and do some work. You may go over there and do some work uh, at some point. The point is, you know, don't buy properties where you, 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 you're always scared and you're fearful. Right. Keep that in mind. And I'm not, I'm not telling you don't buy properties wherever you want to buy property. Buy them where you want. But just remember, you may have to go over to that property and visit that property at a time that's not convenient or not or later in the evening. And you might not uh, feel feel good about that. So keep that in mind as well. All right. Number nine, plan on taking good care of your properties. I've been mentioning it throughout this. Take care of the properties. The last thing that we need out here is more slumlords, people that just buy a property, put anybody in the property, don't screen their tenants at all. And next thing you know, that person tears, tears the property up. The landlord doesn't care. And they're not going over there making the repairs. You don't want that for your properties, okay? Now, if you have 15, 20, 30 properties, I know these things are more apt to happen. But at that point, maybe you need a property manager, right? But if you're buying your first rental property, which is what this talk is all about, be sure that you're getting in the game to take care of the properties that you actually purchase. We don't need more slumlords, right? Um, so, um, but again, you know, you don't want to treat your property. I'm just looking through some comments here. Don't treat your property or your tenants, um, you know, worse than you would, you know, treat, treat anything, right? You just let it get, get ran down. You don't care about it. All you collect, all you do is collect the cash and you don't care what the property looks like. You know, try not to be that landlord when you buy your first rental property. Now, number 10, when you buy, be sure that you join some local associations. Now, when I say local associations, I mean the local landlord association, the local real estate association. The reason you want to join those things is because you want to actually um, partner or see, you want to get around people that are actually doing what you want to do. You want to learn from them. You want to get information to, from people that have been doing this for years and years and years, people that are proven, right? You never stop educating yourself as a landlord. You never stop saying, okay, how can I learn to do things differently? Um, how could I, you know, get better at screening tenants? How can I get better at advertising or marketing my uh, empty rental properties? Um, you know, when I started 22 years ago, we used to put signs in the yard and signs in the window for rent, right? We don't do that. People don't do that anymore, right? We, they don't do that at all. What people do is they use online sources, right? We used to uh, have people mail in their 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 rent each month, or we would go pick it up, right? We don't do that anymore, right? Things change, and when things change, you got to be flexible in terms of how you change with the times, right? So always be educating yourself, and the best way to do that is join some of those local associations where you can be near people that are doing what you want to do. You can learn from them. And oftentimes, little secret, the people that are at those landlord associate, landlord association meetings once a month, they have insights to investors and deals. And sometimes they're selling their property they, they've had for 30 years. They just want to get rid of it. So you can gleam a lot. You can learn a lot. You can gather a lot of information. You can gather a lot of knowledge and wisdom from those local associations. There's people there that got the knowledge that you want, right? Maybe this is not your only rental property. Maybe you want to buy 10 properties over the next five years. There's going to be a ton of information inside of those landlord association meetings and, re and real estate organizations, et cetera. 
join them. Join them on Instagram. Join them on Facebook. Join them on Twitter, wherever you are. Join those groups, all right? Now, number 11 is this, right? Remember this, guys. It's, it's a rental property. It's not your primary residence. Now, I, when I say that, I don't mean that you, again, when you want to keep it all shabby when you buy your first rental property. But you don't have to fix it up with the highest quality of lighting fixtures or the highest grade of carpet and carpet pad or the highest grade of wood floors that you can possibly ever imagine. You want to fix it up, get the property ready to rent. You want to get that property ready to rent for that. It's, you know, make sure it's clean, make sure that it's livable, make sure that it's very nice, but also you don't have to break the bank to have the absolute highest quality stainless steel um, refrigerator, right? You just don't need to do that, okay? You need to have good quality appliances and, and fixtures in the property, but it's not, you don't live there, okay? Again, I'm not saying make it shabby, right? What I am saying is make sure it's livable, it's neat, it's clean, it's well taken care of, but you don't have to put you don't have to buy the $75 handle for the front door when there's a very, very comparable $30 handle for the front door. Just as, as an example, guys. Number 12, remember, and this is this is number 12. I probably should have led off with number one. Number 12 is the absolute most important thing you are ever going to do as a landlord or as a property owner or a property manager, however you want to say it. This is the absolute number one, Okay. Number one thing you're ever going to do is you're going to screen tenants because it doesn't matter if you put the $80 handle on the door or the $30 handle on the door. If you get the wrong people in there, they're going to tear up that $80 door, $80 handle on the door, just like they tear up the $30 handle on the door. So screening tenants, getting the right tenant in the property who is not, you know, getting good tenant. Now, here's what makes a good tenant. What makes a good tenant is not, do I like them? Are they wonderful people? There's really only two things that make a good tenant. Just like these two things, these same two things will make a bad tenant. Number one, do they pay on time? Number two, do they take care of the property? That's it. Whether you like them, whether you don't like them, whether they're nice people, they're mean people, like all those things can't matter to you as a landlord, okay? You can't get into all that. Again, it's a business. It's nice to like your tenants, but do they respect the property and take care of the property? Do they pay their rent in full on time every month, right? Those are the primary things that make a good tenant. Now, you have your job, your number one job as a landlord is to screen tenants properly. Now, I always like to pre-screen tenants because I don't want to waste time with people. I don't want people to waste my time and I certainly don't want to waste other people's time. So I like to pre-screen tenants, ask them a few questions before we I ever even show them the property. Because one, I do not want your money. I don't want your application fee if this is not a good fit for you. Now, some, you know, I know we do all these online applications now. A lot of landlords do that. They go through all these services, Zillow, apartments.com, and they have you just fill out a, an online application that says, hey, we got a $75 application fee and you haven't even seen the property, your, your tenant or the potential tenants haven't even seen the property. I don't do it like that. I'm a little more old school. I don't even want your application unless you, we've had a conversation and you've seen the property. So I'm a little different in that because I don't believe in taking people's money just to take their money for an application if the property may not even be what they want. They may not even suit their needs. They may not even like the property. So I always make sure that I pre-screen tenants, which means I have a conversation with potential tenants prior to them even looking at the property, prior to them even filling out an application. And so that to me as a landlord, that's the fair thing to do to people. I'd never, listen, I'm a person, I don't want to go buy um, something, a pair of shoes without first trying them on. That's just me. And again, I'm old school with that. And so I feel like I don't want to take an, applications, uh, an application fee unless we everything's on the up and up. 
you've seen the property, et cetera. But that's a that's a part of my pre-screening process. So you as a landlord or a first-time landlord, you got to have a pre-screening or screening process because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I don't care what any landlord tells you. I'm 22 years in this game and I've been doing it 22 years by myself. There's nothing else you're going to do as a first time as, as a landlord or property manager, property owner that rents out property. There's nothing you're going to do that is more important than screening the people that you decide to be in there. That's number one. Uno, I told you I should have led the whole thing with that. But if you do everything right, listen, and it's, and it's not a foolproof plan, right? Whatever process you come up to put the right tenants in there, it's not foolproof. And when I say process, let me just back up. I mean, you got to have certain criteria, right, that you hold to and is a part of what you decide is your business, the standard is. A written set of criteria is always good because a written set of criteria, um, that helps with lawsuits and things as well. So keep that in mind, guys. Your tenant screening, whatever process you decide, criteria and standards you come up with, that you got you got to you got to hold strong to that okay now if you get bad tenants in your property often then you need to start looking at your processes and what you're doing wrong as a landlord if you go through and you have five or six or three or four or two or three bad tenants in a row figure out what you did wrong instead of what a lot of landlords do who say you know what I'm done with it I'm out of the game Instead of looking inward and saying, again, you're a business, and this is what a business does, right? When a business starts to lose money, a business doesn't just blame all customers. A business begins to look inward and say, how can we change our processes? How can we do things different? And if you're thinking like a business and you own property or you're buying a property, you got to say, if I got two or three bad tenants in a row, what did I do wrong? What can I do better? How can I change my process so that I can do things a little different next time? That's part of making this a business. And it's also going to shore up and help you ultimately over the long haul. It's going to help you figure out a process that works for you for getting in good tenants. Right now, um, number 13 is this. Once you have a good tenant and you got your process down and you think you've got your process down because it's going to change as you get more experience. But then you got to figure out what it's going to take for you to keep good tenants. OK, because everybody talks about getting them. But then how, if you get a good tenant, how do you keep and retain that good tenant, right? This means, you know, preventive maintenance, uh, making sure that, um, you know, you do things on a regular basis to provide preventive maintenance because you have a good tenant and you want that tenant to stay. So you go through and clean the gutters on a regular basis. You go through and have the HVAC service. You, you call over a plumber every now and then to walk through the house. And let the let the um, let the tenant know that these are things you're doing to make sure the place is comfortable. That's that's just a tactic. That's just a strategy to keep a really really good tenant. And sometimes when you're a landlord and you have a really good tenant, you know maybe you might have to do a little extra negotiating on rental increases. Maybe you don't want to rent increase the rent at such a, a, a expedient or quick way because you got a good tenant. You know sometimes if you have a good tenant and they pay a thousand dollars a month and everybody else, you know, the rental rates have gone up to thirteen hundred dollars a month around them. Instead of raising the rental price to thirteen hundred dollars, maybe you raise that rental price only sixty dollars or seventy five dollars, a hundred dollars. You don't. In other words, you do things to help retain good people, good tenants. Very important. Number 14. Remember I got 17 of these. I think, yeah, 17. Number 14 is this. Um, you got to figure out when you buy a rental property, how are you going to calculate your rental rates when you buy and before you went rent out the property? What are you going to charge for rents? Are you going to use the um, the old 1% method? And what the 1% method is this. If the total market value of the property that you're renting out is $200,000, you charge around $2,000 of rent. 1% of the market value of the property. If it's a property that's only worth $80,000, Perhaps it's more, your rents are going to be more like around $800, right? That's that's an old tried and true method. But another, my, my more favorite method of figuring out what your rental rates are going to be is just simply comparables in the area. Comparables in the area. If you have a two bedroom, one bath in that area, what are other two bedroom, one baths selling for or not selling for, renting for, right? So you got to figure out rental rates and you need to keep that in mind as you're actually um, 
researching and doing your property search for the, your first property that you want to purchase. What can you rent that property out um, right now in that area with those amenities? Okay. So number 15, how are you going to collect rents? I mentioned it earlier. Are you going to use apps? Are you going to use cash app? Are you going to use Zelle? Are you going to use Venmo or whatever the latest app is out there? How are you going to collect rents? And, you know, again, old school, we were mail-in pickup. Some people still do mail-in pickup, right? Drop off, et cetera. But that's something that you want to consider. Have that process down. I always like to provide a tenant with several ways that they're comfortable. So I want to be active on some of the um, the apps, right? I want to be active on those things. I also want to have a PO box in case they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm older. I don't know much about apps. Can I just mail it in? Whatever it may be. But just have several avenues, several um, ways that a tenant can actually uh, send in their rent. Think about that. Now, number 16 probably could have been number one or number two, because this is going to make or break you as a landlord. It's just simply this. You've got to ask yourself a couple of questions. One, do you like people? Are you okay with dealing with people on a regular basis? Um, do you take things personal and get mad and get angry quick? That's you. Maybe landlording is not for you. Maybe managing your own properties is not for you. Do you fly off the handle and have a hot temper? Maybe it's not for you, right? Um, can you look people in the eye? Now, this is a hard one, right? Can you look people in the eye and tell them, um, no, um, you're going to have to move. Um, you know, you haven't paid your rent for a month and a half. We're going to have to file eviction for you. Can you look people in the eye? Now, I'm saying that look people in the eye. Nowadays, you don't necessarily have to look them in the eye, but I like to say, listen, if you can look people in the eye and tell them no and tell them we're going to have to evict you or you're going to have to we're going to file for eviction. If you can do that, you got tough skin and you need thick skin to be a landlord. It takes thick skin um, to be a landlord um, because it's tough. You're dealing with people. Of course, every time you deal with people, it's always more challenging. Right. Anything. I don't care if you. Work on the assembly line and assembly line at General Motors, right? If you gotta put the widget in, that's easy, right? But you know, if you gotta fold, if you gotta type something out, that's easy. But when you gotta look people in the eye and you gotta connect with people and make the tough call and have the tough conversations, that's why those people get paid more money because it's more difficult to do. And that's the thing. If you if you're not that's not you, then perhaps you don't need to be managing rental property. Perhaps you need to not be in that aspect of real estate, or maybe you need to pass it on to someone else or a property manager to do, because I'm not saying you have to like people necessarily, but I'm saying you have to be able to deal with people on a regular basis because, you know, landlording is all about people. Yeah. It's about getting the property together and making sure it's right and collecting rents and all that stuff, but you got to be able to deal with people. You got to be able to say the things that are hard to say, that are tough to say, right? Um, you know, when tragedy happens, somebody loses their job. Uh, somebody says, I, I don't have the rent. Or when somebody says, you know, um, you know, it's 12, it's one o'clock in the morning and I lock myself out of my house. You know, these are things that will happen if you manage your own property. Now, number 17 is this very important. If becoming a landlord or property owner is not for you, there's other ways to get into real estate. You don't have to just be a landlord, right? You can always, I mean, you can invest in REITs, R-E-I-T-S, right? Real Estate Investment Trust. You can invest in those um, and that's total hands off. You can, um, you know, work in real estate. You can become an agent, a broker. I mean, you can work for a title company. There's, there's all different ways. If you really enjoy real estate, but you've looked at being a landlord and you feel like being a landlord is not for you, then... There's other ways you can get into it, right? There's other things you can do. There are many ways to in, invest in real estate that don't necessarily require you being a landlord or require you to manage your own property or require you to deal with people or work with people, right? Lots of things that you are able to do in real estate. So, all right, so here's the deal, guys. Um, real estate is good. Love real estate. Doing it for a long time. Um, the prop I have a few prop the properties I have are gonna you know serve me well in retirement. They're gonna provide you know monthly income for me. They've appreciated. They'll be passed down. There's so many positive and pros 
into having some real estate, but you need to be prepared before you get into it. And listen, you can study long, you can study everything, you can research everything, you can read everything out there, you can listen to all the YouTube channel, all the YouTube, and I have, you know, probably a hundred videos on my YouTube channel about real estate, right? You can look at all those videos, but listen, the most important thing is you got to pull the trigger. You got to do something. You got to actually, the best way to learn about real estate is to do some real estate, right? It's not to talk about it. It's not to think about it. It's not to dream about it. It's not to write about it. It's not to have conversations, not to have, look at other people. The best way to learn is to do it. Once you do a deal or two, you're going to pick up so, so much information. Um, it's crazy. So I just ran down 17 things that you need to think about before you buy your first rental property. Listen, if you have any questions for me, guys, drop it in the comments. Go check this video out on YouTube. I'm going to put it up and upload it there for you to go back and look at. Go back and share. There's jewels. There's valuable information in this content. And I want to make sure it gets out. It's free content. This game is free right here, guys. And I want you to take advantage of it. Again, if you got anything out of this, drop me a comment below. Let me know what you got out of it. And let me know, is there anything else that a person should be considering before they become a landlord? Okay. I always end my broadcast with this, guys, or any of my videos with this. The best person to take care of the old you it's going to be the young you. It's not going to be um, the state. It's not going to be the hospital. It's not going to be the country. It's not going to be the president. It's not going to be your local city council member. It's not even going to be your kids and your grandkids, right? The best person that's going to take care of the old you is going to be the you today, the young you, the you right now. That's who's going to take the best care of the old you. Real estate is an excellent way Buy and hold real estate, real estate that you can collect rents on and you can ultimately have and appreciate and they go up in value over time. That's the best person and one of the best ways to take care of the old you. All right. You guys take care of yourself. Take care of other people. And until the next video. Peace.